Hello, this is amazing. This is amazing. I can't believe we're seeing real people. We normally do Telegraph Beauty School as a virtual event. So this is so nice to see people in the flesh. Um, so hello and welcome to the Telegraph Beauty School Spring Reset. Um, I'm so excited to bring this to life at the Soho Hotel in London. Um, and hello to everyone um, at home. I know we have been streamed, live streamed to a, an audience at home. So hello everyone from home. Um, my name is Sonia Harrier. I am the beauty director at The Telegraph. And um, I have got a panel of brilliant experts that I am going to ask lots of questions to, lots of um, tips and tricks that we all want to know. I know there's a lot of personal things I want to be asking all three of these experts here. Um, and I know there's lots of questions that we had beforehand. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome my panel. Um, my first guest is the world-class makeup artist, Hannah Martin. We couldn't wait to have her back. Um, <laughs> she was on the very first Telegraph Beauty School. And um, honestly, the, the things Hannah knows about just nailing the best signature makeup isn't worth knowing like she knows so much i learn a lot from hannah and i'm sure everyone else will tonight um another uh, familiar face um from telegraph beauty school is dr Awoma, who is such a fountain of knowledge when it comes to skincare um honestly we couldn't get through the questions fast enough last time when uh yeah was it sort of last september yeah. you were on mm -hmm. it was amazing so Again, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else will as well. So we've got lots of skincare questions coming up for Dr. Awoma. And lastly, we've got um, Dr. Ashwin Soni, who is a transformation, tra transformation specialist. So a, a plastic surgeon, uh, but now is a real um, talent when it comes to um, injectables. And I, there are so many questions we've been asked about tweakments and treatments. Um, so, Dr. Sony is here to answer all of those questions. So, without further ado, I'm going to kind of kick things off. Firstly, from, from you, Hannah. Great. <laughs> I'm going to come to you first because, does, I mean, seasonally, we want to change our kind of skincare, makeup. I, is that something you get requested a lot from your clients? Like, do they kind of want to go into the summer months? with maybe a bit of a refreshed face. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it makes perfect sense, right? When you change your winter wardrobe, it's a fairly similar process when it comes to your makeup bag because um, I don't know if anyone in the room agrees, like in the winter when my skin's probably at its kind of least fresh looking, I don't mind a bit more coverage and I, I lean for my mattes to go with my chunky knits. Yes. But then as we segue into spring, summer, um, those kind of flat mattes don't seem to marry quite so well with like lighter florals or pastel tones so it's fully appropriate yeah to recheck your makeup bag and potentially swap out some of your staples for maybe lighter fresher textures and tones ready for the summer mm. and dr awoma should we be sort of shifting our skincare regime from the winter to the summer is that a thing yeah definitely um and that's something that i do a lot myself so when it comes to sort of my um, summer skincare, I tend to gravitate towards more sort of lighter um, textures and formulations, just because I know we all love a rich cream, but it's a bit much for summer. <laughs> so I like to go a little bit easy with that. Um, and then also I tend to um, stray away from the actives as well. So specifically retinols and acids, um, because I find that the colder months where you're not fighting against the sun, using retinol and acids is just so much easier versus trying to use them in the summer because um, again, just for context, um, acids can increase the skin sensitivity to the sun. So if you know, you've got blazing sun, putting acid on your face every day, yeah, it's a recipe for disaster. So those are some of the pointers that I like to give with summer skincare. Yeah. And um, Dr. Sony, have you found that there's been a real um, drive towards people wanting more tweakments as, as opposed to, I guess, more, um, you know, treatments that perhaps have more intervention? Yeah, I think so, definitely. I mean, being a plastic surgeon, um, the majority of my practice now actually comprises of non-surgical injectables. And there's a lot that you can do now, you know, in the form of tweakments that you, you know, previously would have to undergo, you know, an incision and undergo, you know, be under the knife, which now you really don't have to. You can get really wondrous results. And there's definitely been an increase in the demand of that. I think, obviously, we all know, like the Zoom Boom 
as we all call it, had, had a huge effect on us all looking into a mirror constantly on yes. the screen every day. And it's just not <laughs> natural to do. And so I think we all noticed, myself included, like all the imperfections that were existing on my forehead or whatever. And so I think, you know, it's definitely, there's definitely been a rise in, in popularity with, with all of these uh, types of non-social interventions. Yeah, and we're, we're going to do a real deep dive, don't worry about jowls, because honestly, <laughs> that was the topic. We had so many questions pre-submitted. And just to flag also, for anyone watching virtually, there's a chat box on your screen. You'll see a chat box. Pop any questions in and we will get around to some of those later. Um, it will come through to me here. Very technical. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're going to get around to jowls later. But I think what I'd love to begin with is um, sort of starting um, with, with Ash. What um, When it comes to the kind of forehead, mm -hmm. one of the topics that kind of kept coming up in terms of questions was you know, when it comes to brows and like deep set lines here, mm -hmm. what is the, do we always need to go down a Botox route or is there a sort of alternative and how would you treat, um, how would you treat the kind of upper forehead area? Yeah, you know, I think it really comes down to like a patient's goals um, and expectations in terms of what they want. Obviously, um, Dr. Wang will mention, we'll talk about skincare as well, which is a huge, which really complements every procedure that I do. Um, really well and I, I do a lot of skincare as well in my practice but I think regarding intervention like obviously we we probably know most people know that Botox is really the mainstay treatment for the forehead area the one thing that I do you know I think for short term is great to like minimize the lines you know it, there's a definite possibility to not be left with a frozen forehead my technique um, and I actually published um, a piece with with your good friend Bridget in Harper's recently about this but really like a baby Botox technique, which really in my eyes is the way that Botox should be done. It allows expression of all the facial muscles without blocking it and leaving that frozen look. And I think that's the concern that a lot of people have who, who come to me and have never had any treatments done, um, is that oh, I don't wanna be left with a frozen look. I don't want it to be super obvious that I've had this done. Um, you can express afterwards the lines just go. And I think long-term, you mentioned deep set lines mm -hmm. specifically the Botox is amazing at long term preventing those lines from getting deeper and deeper and I see patients who come into me who, who've had deep set lines for like maybe 10 or more years um, to the point where Botox can't really get rid of them then it can soften it slightly and sometimes patients come to me and say oh my goodness I've got this crater on my forehead please address it for me and sometimes you can fill it slightly yeah. just to soften it but you can never really get rid of it so if you can get as soon as you notice those lines at rest on the forehead, it's a great time to start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And obviously meet somebody, go for a consultation. There's never an obligation to, to go ahead with that. But I think, yeah. you know, Botox really is the mainstay for that area. And um, Dr. Oema, when it comes to kind of, um, you know, the, the skincare staples that almost precede any injectables and, you know, if you want to get your skincare into a really sort of good shape before you either decide to go down injectables route or non-injectables mm -hmm. or... Um, what are the, the real kind of basics that you think everyone should have in their bathroom cabinet? And I know this is a really yeah. big question because it's really are there any like, you know, we all want to know what's the hero and wonder ingredient that we all need to have in our skincare regime? This is <laughs> oh, so, dear. This is so hard, Sonia. Like, you should see, like, my, like, my beauty cabinet <laughs> shelf <laughs> cupboard at home. Like, it literally looks like a shop. So I'll try and distill it into a couple of products. But first and foremost, definitely retinoids, a.k.a. retinols. Um, so I absolutely love retinols as an active. Um, they're essentially a topical that's proven to treat and prevent fine lines and wrinkles. So if you want to kind of get your skincare routine going, you know, you're concerned about, you know, looking, you know, your best self, making sure that you're keeping the skin healthy and young, definitely retinols are the one to go to. In terms of actual product recommendations, because everyone likes product recommendations. <laughs> we, um, we want to know what is in your bathroom cabinet. Um, I love um, the um, retinoids from Medicate. Mm -hmm. So they have a ton of different retinoids. Like, it's a little bit confusing, but they have a great guide on the website um, if you are a little bit stuck in terms of where to start from. But I really love specifically their Crystal Retinol mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of in silver packaging, comes in a couple of different strengths. Just start from the lowest, work your way up. But that's a really nice kind of entry retinol. Could you use that in the spring, like as we're sort of moving into the summer months? Would you still sort of, um, would you use a retinol or would you sort of, you know, maybe um, use it, you know, alternate nights or? 
would you change anything? Yeah, so um, I know there is a little bit of a myth that, you know, as the weather gets warmer, you yeah. should maybe stay away from retinoids. But definitely you can continue to use them. Of course, just make sure that you wear ample sunscreen. <laughs> a lot of us don't wear enough sunscreen. Um, and also, um, you know, just allow your skin to guide you. So if you find that actually, you know, by using retinols in warmer sort of climates, your skin isn't quite taking to it, just kind of ease it back. Um, but yeah, really just kind of use your skin as a guide. So you're, you're using your retinoid at night time and then how about, a sort of, do you need to be using a serum in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of how I like to structure skincare routine, so as we discussed, nighttime is great for things like retinoids. And then in terms of the daytime, that's where I like to focus on hydration, um, i.e. using serums that are rich in things like polyglutamic acid, hyaluronic acid, um, or even um, using serums rich in antioxidants. Um, like vitamin C, ferulic acid. Do you want a product recommendation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, so in terms of um, a really great hydrating serum, um, a product that I literally tried out this week. Hot uh, off the press. Really <laughs> overdue though, so it's really not that new. Sorry guys. Um, but it's the Cosrx Snail Mucin oh. Essence. Mm. The hype is very real with that product and it's like, what, 15 to 20 pounds, super cheap, but it gives the really high-end brands a run for its money. It's so good. A bit sticky, a bit sticky. Mm. Literally feels like, you know, snell, mucin. Yeah. But um, it's a great product. Um, and then in terms of antioxidants, SkinCeuticals, um, they have a great product called CE Ferulic. Um, and that's rich that. in, do you love it too? Love it. Rich in vitamin C and ferulic acid as well. Amazing. So we, we are sending a list, uh, a list tomorrow because actually I want your yeah. list. Too. Can I get my <laughs> list? <please>? Yes. <laughs> um, and um, Hannah, yeah. I know it's going to, it's quite a difficult question, but when it comes to the kind of, you know, the brows and the, the upper face, how important is it to do our brows, to do something to our brows? Oh, so important. Mm. So important. It, it, they, they, they're the frame of your eyes. They help struck to your face um yeah so important it doesn't mean you suddenly need to fill in your brows with a thick dark pencil and create something really intense but even the slightest if you're nervous of filling in your brows for fear that they'll be too strong just a very light powder application so just an angled brush draw some powder through the brows following the direction of the growth of the hairs and it will just yeah just really help frame the eyes in a way that it almost as well as mascara can you know it's the same kind of mm. um drawing of your features together what's your favorite brow product yeah i i do love anastasia beverly hills mm. i just think they do so many different shades and when you buy an eyeshadow or a brow eyeshadow you've always got two tones so a cooler tone and a warmer tone the thought process being that if you mix the tones you'll create a bit more definition so it won't look flat so yeah, they're really lovely. Amazing. And interestingly, what you say about contouring, because we were having this chat earlier yeah. with um, Dr. Ash, um, and with with filler placed in the right way, you really can sort of contour the face, can't you, in a very subtle way? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really can be used, um, if you strategically place, like, you don't need large volumes of filler anywhere, to be honest. You just need small volumes, but really well placed, and you can create natural contouring. So. When I do cheek fillers or jawline fillers um, specifically, because those are the areas where you re I really consider it more sculpting than anything else, um, you can really create just a beautiful natural contour that people, it's not, you don't need to have the really full cheeks like we were talking about, you just need, and obviously everyone's anatomy is different, everyone's volume is different depending on their age and their anatomy, but you just need a really nice subtle and you can, and if you follow the, the line of the cheekbone or for example, the mandible for the jaw, you can create like a really beautiful result, um, which just creates a lovely kind of natural contour. I think the real, um, you know, the, the, the scary thing about getting filler or injectables is that overdone look. <laughs> right. So yeah. is that something that your clients kind of come to you almost kind of quite terrified of? Yeah, of course. And, you know, I, I would say actually the majority of patients, you know, nearly 70 percent of my patients who come to me have never had anything done before, which is a mm. super high percentage. And I think that's also because I I stress natural looking results. I think picking your provider correctly is the biggest thing I can stress when it comes to how you're gonna look. Of course, you have to have your own goals as patients and go in kind of knowing at least some areas that you're, that bother you if you look in the mirror or you know you have photos taken of yourself. But I think 
picking the right provider couldn't be more important. You know, look, you know, research your provider really, really well. Look at before and afters on their website or their social media. Don't go based just number on the number of followers they have on Instagram or some of the ways that some people do. Really, really study them. Know what their experience was with facial anatomy because I think that is the key to getting natural looking and beautiful results. Mm, amazing. Um, so when it comes to skin texture and tone, mm. now this is something that we've been asked a lot about. Um, obviously, pigmentation is a real concern, um, I think, for any age, but particularly sort of as we age, but also in the summer months, you know, um, handling pigmentation. What's your remedy for pigmentation, Dr. Aroma? Yeah, that's a very common question that I yeah. get asked. I'd probably say the most common question that I get asked, yeah. yeah. And there really are kind of, you know, a few different approaches when it comes to hyperpigmentation. Um, I like to look at it in a couple of ways. So first of all, um, you need to kind of look at or even address preventing getting the pigmentation in the first place. So what do I mean by that specifically? So you can get hyperpigmentation, you know, dark spots, things like that through a couple of different ways. So it could be due to the fact that you're not wearing sunscreen. That's a really common way. Or it might be, you know, due to the fact that, you know, acne is a real issue for you. Um, again, I see acne um, in clinic of all ages. It's not just something for teenagers. Um, you know, that can be a source of what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, so if you are kind of experiencing you know, those things, again, the solution is going to be making sure that you wear sunscreen. Or if acne is the problem, making sure that you're addressing the acne. So that's the first thing. And then moving on to, OK, you have the pigmentation. What do you do? Um, there's a couple of different actives I really love to use. Um, so they're generally called um, tyrosinase inhibitors. Basically a fancy word for um, an ingredient that interferes with the menylene producing pathway or the pigment producing pathway. Um, and some of those actives within this category include things like vitamin C, um, you know, different types of acid, such as glycolic acid. Um, I also really love kojic acid. Um, and then also things such as arbutin. Um, and if you can get your hand on a prescription, um, also hydroquinone when used under doctor supervision mm -hmm. and carefully, just to stress that, use <laughs> carefully, can be a really great solution as well. And these acids, are they safe to use on a daily basis? Uh, yes and no. So, again, I'm probably going to sound like a parrot repeating myself, <laughs> no, but it's, it's very much about kind of reading your skin and knowing what your skin can handle. So it's literally like, in a way, like a science experiment. So kind of testing out products on your skin and then kind of seeing how your skin responds to that. Um, because for some people, they can use acid every day. That's also going to be people with oily, thick, resilient skin. But with others, using an acid every day, their skin's going to fall off. Um, but generally speaking, I would say, is that you? That's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but generally speaking, once to a couple of times a week is kind of a great frequency for acids. Amazing. Um, so moving on to eyes with Hannah. Uh, so <laughs> what are the new eye products you are absolutely loving? Are there any products that you have recently discovered that you think everyone needs to have in their makeup bag? What will make our lives more simple when it comes to... Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily new, but I'm a huge fan of cream eyeshadow sticks. And I think right, most yeah. brands do them now. Yeah. So the ones that slip off the tongue are uh, Bobbi Brown, By Terry, um, Beauty Pie, uh, Laura Mercier, Vive. Um, most brands do a really great cream shadow stick. And I think some people are reluctant to go down that road because they think, oh, cream eyeshadow, it's just going to crease, it's going to come off. But actually formulas now are water resistant, smudge resistant, 16, 18, 20 hour wear. Um, so they're really great if you've got two seconds. You just go straight from the bullet, do a scribble, blend it with your ring finger and you're done. So it's quick, easy. Once it's on, it doesn't smudge, it doesn't crease. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So actually, that's one of my favourites for kind of those five minute makeup days. Um, and then I actually use them on clients as a base because they're so long wearing. So I'll prep a lid with a long wear cream shadow stick and then press my powders into that just to make it Ooh. really long wearing. That's a good trick. Amazing. Um, sticking with the eyes, um, Dr. Ash, we've been asked a few questions about tear troughs. Mm -hmm. So... Um, can you explain what tear trough filler is, Absolutely. What, how you would find out if you're a good candidate for it and what it can help with? Absolutely. So I do this actually very commonly in my practice. So 
tear trough is really the concavity that we have that some of us have just a really deep and hollow under the eyelid so it's kind of your lower eyelid and when people describe like the, the dark bags or the dark circles it can often mean that you have a concavity here now what happens with everything in aesthetics and everything that i do in with injectables is when the light hits the face it creates shadows and if you have like a hollowing here under the eyes it can really accentuate the shadowing causing us to look more tired less refreshed which is the common thing that people say they say i feel really tired and sometimes it's like the stress of our lives and I have a lot of you know mums and different professionals and a lot of people coming through my clinic and it can often mean just they've just got this hollowing so the the, the most effective treatment in the people who are suitable candidates for it and you said who would make a good candidate um, would really just, you need an evaluation, you need a consultation to determine whether you're, you know, you just need to be examined really to, to see whether you'd be a candidate. Now, some people who have certain types of bags wouldn't be candidates because you, you can't place more products in something that's already, you know, we have fat pads underneath here and over time that can change. Some people genetically just have larger fat pads that are more bulging. You've got to be very careful about what's surgical and non-surgical. Being a plastic surgeon, I do a lot of eyelid surgeries and I do a lot of non-surgical tear troughs. So I'm able to evaluate a patient and say, this is the best treatment for you. Of course, if I can do it non-surgically, I will, because even though I'm a surgeon, like we've talked about, I would much rather do a conservative approach than do something invasive. Um, but you're essentially strategically placing filler just in the under eye where the concavity is um, and just softening that hollowing, essentially. The results typically last around, in my practice, 12 to 14 months before they need topping up. People are very nervous about getting, you know, that it's around my eyelid. Is it going to be really painful? You just have to go to someone who knows what they're doing and knows the anatomy. Of course, things can go wrong with any injectable procedure, especially when you're around sensitive areas. But um, I do this a lot. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's straightforward in the right hands. So um, you can get a really lovely result. Yeah, amazing. Because, I mean, dark circles, Dr. Waymer, is mm -hmm. something that I feel I want to know about all the time, you know, like, are there any um, products or types of ingredients that actually work? And do we do we need to be using an eye cream? What's the yeah. what? How do you feel about dark circles? Oh, dark circles. <laughs> that's another. Uh, yeah, it's a touchy subject. Yeah. Very touchy sub <laughs> subject. And I think really, you know, it's an area that really crosses over with, you know, kind of the injectable treatments as mentioned by Dr. Ash. Um, it really depends on, you know, why you're getting the dark circles in the first place. Right. So dark circles can be due to a variety of different reasons. So a really common one that I come across is essentially hyperpigmentation um, to the under eye area. Um, that can be something, again, genetic, again, really common in um, South Asian patients, um, or it can happen with age. Um, so that can be one cause of, of dark circles. Or it could be due to the concavity, as mentioned, that, you know, and that concavity can cause shadows. Um, or even it could be due to the fact that, um, you know, the skin under the eye is super thin. And so hence you can get um, the appearance of the blood vessels underneath coming through, giving it that kind of bluish, grey, purple appearance. So, yeah, first of all, it's really important to figure out where you kind of fit right. in those categories. Yeah. If it's the concavity aspect... No eye cream's going to do anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like nothing. <laughs> you need to go to Dr. Ash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Um, but then, you know, if it's something like pigmentation, yes, by all means, you can get an eye product. So um, in terms of product recommendations, <laughs> no, um, an eye it. cream that I really love, and I don't think it's a placebo. I don't think. But it generally works. <laughs> to the point, I'm like, does this really work? Well, I think it works. It? Um, is the um, Dark Circle Eye Cream by Ren. Mm. Um, yeah, it's in a white and kind of orange packaging. There's something about that. It makes a difference. Um, if you want something a little bit more purse friendly, um, Superdrug, their own brand, so specifically the Me Plus range and the B Skin range, they both have um, brightening eye creams as well. Amazing. Um, I mean, dark circles to cover up as well. Let's just stay with the dark circles. Yeah. Tips. The, the, uh, how, how well, the do great we... thing is, whether it's it's tricky when it's a shadow, um, mm. concavity. Yes. <laughs> Putting that one in my back yeah. pocket. Yeah. Say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes people don't know it's a contour, it's a shadow. Yeah. So they'll be layering concealer going, I've still got dark circles. I'm like, put your head back, put your mirror above your head. No, you don't. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's just the shadow. Mm. Um, but any dark circle can be hidden with makeup. 
that's the great thing. So what you need is a corrector. So if you just keep layering your concealer going, come on, out down spot, come on. <laughs> what you'll do is yes, you'll be building up the makeup, but with a dark shadow underneath, you'll have a dullness coming through so you will still see that discoloration. So you need to cut through the discoloration with a corrector. So then when you put your concealer on top, it looks really even. So it's like shampoo and conditioner, totally different things, but you use them together. I think some people are like, but I don't want to use two things under my eyes. Yes. I'm like, trust me, it will work. So long and short is if the discoloration under your eyes is kind of pinky purple, then you want a pinky corrector. Um, so the best ones on the market are, of course, Bobbi Brown Cosmetics, MAC Cosmetics. Um, Charlotte Tilbury does do some under eye correctors, but they're more in the peachy family. Um, if the shadow under your eyes is slightly greyish, maybe a bit brown, then a peach toned corrector is what you need. So simply lay that colour over the area where you see the darkness. So if you're not dark here, don't put your corrector there, you don't need it. So for me, it's mainly kind of inner corner of the eye and then just either side of the bridge of the nose. I'm quite veiny there, so that's where my corrector goes. And then if you follow me, you'll know you've got to press it. So press with the technique. flat pad of your finger. It's not tipping it with the very tip of your finger. You're not wiping, you're, you're pushing it very gently into the skin because you, you need a layer. It's a bit like, your undercoat on your fresh plaster. You want a really nice layer, but work it into the skin so it sits nicely. Then all you need is a tiny bit of your skin tone corrector on top and your shadows are gone. That's, that pressing motion is a real game changer because you, you um, I've learned that from you and honestly it's changed and upped my dark circle game. It's worth cutting long nails off to get right, it's I tell you. So good. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's go for cheeks. Let's talk about cheek contouring. Um if we're if we're going down the kind of injectable route, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Ash, what can we do if we um perhaps feel like we need a bit more structure in the mid face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean again, that's like we kind of touched on it briefly earlier where you can really strategically use a really good, a very good quality filler and just really sharpen over the, we call it the zygoma, but it's basically your cheekbone that runs literally all the way up here. The, I think the common mistake that I see, especially when you see certain celebrities where they look really full, is mm. that the, the you know, you would, you would assume that they're going to the best injectors, but often they're not obeying the natural anatomy. So they're actually not following the cheekbone itself. They go slightly under or they're just putting too much product, which is diffusing across this whole right. area. So it's making, some of the, I won't name the celebrities, but you, you can see when they, they really look very full. You've also got to take into account who's in front of you, you know, like some people just have more cheek volume than others. Obviously, depending on genetics, age, you know, the, the particular patient sitting in front. So you can use a filler really strategically to sharpen and again, give that natural contour. And results of those really in my practice last anywhere between 14 and 15 months. To, you know, the range is 12 to 18 and some people that can really last up to 18 again. It's based on high quality, the high quality filler and, and the provider technique. And, and that's why I think it's very important to just be aware. The smile lines as well is a really important yeah. area because if people have very full cheeks and then they've got these really deep and smile lines, you have a big step off between the cheek and, and you're kind of like this whole mid face area under the nose. So you have to be very careful and guide patients. So you're not putting too much volume here and then they have an even bigger step up. You have to be very careful. But sometimes I do like soften the smile lines um, at the same time. So it just gives a really nice balancing. Um, and again, that everyone, you know, everyone's slightly different. But. Yeah. Um, and so would that be um, the, the best way to treat smile lines would be filler rather than an anti wrinkle injection? Correct. In my in my in my opinion, yes, absolutely. Number one, it gives a better result um, and a more long lasting result. Um, you can sometimes use anti-wrinkle injections, especially around, you know, if you've got downturn corners of the mouth and you've got these really deep marionette lines, which is what they're called. Um, but I, I actually prefer using filler because I think number one, like I said, that it will last you a lot longer mm -hmm. than having Botox every three to six months for that. Um, and you've got to be very careful, especially around the muscles around the mouth. Um, you don't want to, you know, I've, I've had patients who've come to me who've had anti-wrinkle injections injected around there where it's really affected like their speech or can cause them drooling or you've got to be very, very careful where who you're going to and whether they know the anatomy because your your muscle around the mouth is called your orbicularis oris and you it literally is running all the way continuous around. You have to be very you've got other smile muscles in, in close proximity, so you have to be very, very careful who you're going to for that. Um, but I think 
fillers uh, fillers work like amazingly well and just gives you longevity i mean yeah. the filler for that will last you around nine to eleven months for the small line so amazing um so yeah you get a nice softening um let's move on to the glow because uh, obviously we can get really sort of dewy glowy looking skin um through skincare and makeup what um dr Roma, do you what's in your glow kit yeah essentially that's a great question <laughs> well if i must say so i believe glow is my specialty <laughs> i love looking glowy and so i'm always trying to find products that make me look glowy um in terms of what i do for myself there's a couple of things that i do so first of all retinol yeah, she's mentioning it again. <laughs> um, second she of all, retinol. lots of acids. Again, not too much because you don't want to fry your face off, but a good amount of acids. <laughs> um, that could be in the form of a toner, an essence, or if you want to go and get a cosmetic treatment, you can get a chemical pill maybe once a month, every few months as well. Um, and then the next key thing is hydration. Hydration, hydration, hydration. Um, I love a good, what I call, moisture sandwich. So Ooh. combining a hydrating serum, a good moisturiser, if you're more oily, it might be a gel cream. If you're dry, a good thick nourishing cream. Um, and then on top, again, this is optional, um, an oil or some sort of occlusive product. Um, and then, of course, sunscreen. So would that be in the morning? Would you use an oil in the morning underneath a sunscreen as well? I would, but oh. definitely in the colder months, not so much the warm months, because just for context, I have mildly oily dehydrated skin. Um, and so just sticking with SPF mm. um, while we're here, it, I mean, we should be wearing it every day, shouldn't we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want the honest answer? <gasps> oh, oh, Fill the tea. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like the skincare gods are going to strike me down, guys. Wow, the journalists in the room might as well. I know. Yeah. But just for context, again, it's very clear I love skincare, but it's like at the same time, I feel sometimes it's very theoretical and it's like, okay, guys, let's be practical and let's bring skincare into the real world and use skincare as you actually would, as opposed to how maybe you should, if that makes any okay, sense. Yeah. So generally speaking, yes, you should wear sunscreen all year round. Um, in terms of um, specific kind of factors that you should look for, um, in the colder months, you can get away with, say, a SPF of 15 to 30. And then in the warmer months, you can get away with an SPF of 30 to 50. Again, though, another caveat that I want to put across is that if you're someone that has skin of colour, you do have sort of an inbuilt SPF of about 13. So with that in mind, you can be at times a little bit more lenient with sort of the sunscreen application. So what do I mean by that? So say when it comes to, you know, when I'm working from home, unless I'm sitting right in front of the window, I may sit, you know, skip sunscreen. That's okay. I'm, I'm just being judging. honest, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Being honest. <laughs> That's really good to know. Um, and then the glow factor with makeup, because yeah. I mean, honestly, you can go from like feeling, make perhaps not your best, and then with makeup can suddenly like come out of life. It's absolutely. Magic. Yeah, yeah. So what what's in your glow kit for so, like any age? For any age, it's all it's always a couple of steps, but of course your skincare underneath your makeup is super yes. key that like you can buy the most beautiful dewy radiant foundation but if you don't treat your skin beforehand and you mm. apply it your skin will drink all the benefits of the foundation and you won't get that glowy finish but one of my favorite kind of cheats i suppose to getting the perfect glow is using some kind of illuminating product after your skincare and spf and before your foundation so whether it's charlotte tilbury's hollywood flawless filter whether it's um sculpted by amy's tint and glow something with you know um gentle pearl and light reflective particles that you can put all over the face or you can just highlight the areas where you feel like you want to glow so typically that would be the top of the cheeks and maybe a bit on the temples avoid the temples if you are prone to oiliness because it can uh look like perspiration um but do it under your makeup you know what in such an i know way. i know um it's much nicer than saying sweaty, sweaty. Yeah. You're not, you're not like sweaty. we've said it um but doing it underneath your makeup helps create like just a more subtle glow that kind of inner radiance it's like oh gosh you look so healthy um even if you're not feeling it so of course you can use topical glow items whether it's the foundation itself that's illuminating whether it's like it cosmetic cc cream illuminating which has those kind of pearly particles in it or you can use um 
powder or cream based highlighters. If it's a powder highlight, just go easy. It's really easy to overdo. And then you can end up with areas that just look too metallic. And in photographs, it'll just shine white. Mm. So go lightly and always have a second brush to blend out your powder highlight. Um, we both prefer a creamy highlight. So something like um, Westman Atelier's Peau de Peche or Peau de Rose, beautiful cream highlights in a little palette that you then just tap on. And that's a really beautiful classy glow yes how do you stop it kind of um settling into any lines around the, the eyes um is there a technique well the pat the if pat. it's if it's a mm -hmm. if it's a cream then the pat will really help good thing to call out though because if you're using a powder and you do have fine lines around the eyes then just be careful that you're not smiling too much as you do it because when you then release your smile you'll see the areas where you don't have that product but again it's nothing that a quick tap of your finger won't help just to move the product into place amazing right so we're going to move on to lips now because um we had a bit of a discussion earlier on about lip filler and how how to how to do it without it well without it looking like lip filler so what's the technique and what should you ask for if you just want your lips to look a little bit um perhaps like they were five years ago, 10 years ago. Right, yeah, no, I think it's it's good and it's great to go into a consultation really just knowing what it is about your lips that bother you. So for a lot of patients come in and just say, my thinner upper lip slightly bothers me, the you know mismatch, a bit of asymmetry, I just wanna correct, I may just want a little bit more volume um, than, than what I have now. And you know, sometimes occasionally they'll show me a photo of like a few years ago and they'll say, you know, this is kind of, a, had a bit, bit more volume there, just a little plumpness, I think. Again, picking a provider is so key for this, like for lip filler especially, because it's one of the, the procedures that people fear the most mm -hmm. um, because they really don't want to look like, you know, a, a lot of patients, I mean, some people do, of course, but like the patients who are coming to me do not want to look um, in any way that all that, oh my goodness, my friends are all going to notice yes. that I've had lip filler done. If you look at the patients who've had lip filler and come out of my clinic, you just wouldn't know. They've just... But if you look at the before and afters, you'll just see that they're, they, you know, they may, again, like they may have a slightly thinner upper lip or just a slight lack in volume. Again, I use, again, it's a very provider dependent. I use the thinner of the, so for lips, you really need like a medium thickness filler. And when you look at fillers, no matter on the face, it ranges from being really thin, like your under eye filler, to like thicker for your jawline. So lip fillers are kind of in the medium range. I actually use the thinner of the medium thickness, if that makes sense, um, just because I want to give a more natural result. If you use slightly thicker, it can you can literally just bump it from looking natural to looking too filled you've got to obey you know the anatomy in front of you and what you know the t the, the type of um lip shape and lip volume that patients have and how it's going to balance like mm -hmm. if it's going to be balanced or not so um yeah I've, i'm very strategic i don't i do not use large volumes and especially the first time someone is having it done i would rather err on the side of conservative and then they come back and you may if you really, if they really wanted a bit more volume, you can top them up. But I'd rather do it that way than do. You can always put filler in. It's very easy to put filler in. I've never had to dissolve my own filler in my practice, and I hope in my career I do not have to. But it's that technique of just being on the side of more conservative than yeah. too much because you don't want to be taking that out. And then, so let's move on to to jowls and stay yeah. with you, Dr. Sony, for yeah. this. What um, you were you were sort of saying earlier, you're getting much more um sort of interest in the sort of lower face mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. a really popular area to treat now it is actually it's becoming if i if i actually look at the numbers in my practice probably the most common filler procedure i'm doing now which is jawline sculpting wow. um a big reason is for a number of reasons like obviously if you're young you know some people just genetically don't have maybe necessarily a defined jawline but you mentioned jowls i mean that is the most common reason why i'm doing this because as people know, with jowls, you know, you're as you age, and unfortunately, women get it worse for everything, whether it be having kids or you know, facial aging. Oh yeah. And and men can often hide it with a beard, um, but but you know, you you lose the ligamentous support, <laughs> and a lot of women they are doing it. Yeah. You know, a lot of my patients are women, so I like and relate. Um, <laughs> but but if you if you like ar around the around the jawline area itself, we have very tight ligaments when we're young, and those ligaments will relax over time. The first point at which it falls is the point here, which is like our jowl. And pre-jowls actually really start coming in in your 30s in some patients. Like I'll see, you'll start to notice that they just start to lose a little bit of definition from the chin to the to this jowl area. 
And obviously over time, you know, if, if you left it, then it just gets more prominent. Right. Well, you just lose that definition again, like we talked about everything in aesthetics is to do with shadowing, lighting and optics. The minute you create a little bit of definition going all the way from, from the back, I do all the way to the back here, to the base of the ear, which is where the angle of the mandible sits to the chin, you literally just create a nice, beautiful definition. You're not changing the anatomy of somebody. You're just creating a lovely definition that, again, when patients go like this to me, that's the the answer is jawline sculpting um again the results last about 14 15 months you can really create a beautiful result and the the best part of it is that patients look slimmer immediately after the procedure because again the light is no longer hitting the chin area and it's now created a bit of definition and i see a lot of, i can hear people yeah I can, right hear, I can hear i can hear my phone going off right now <laughs> my clinic exactly. phone going off but um but uh but but i mean it's 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 really amazing and you know we were talking about this earlier is that patients previously had to undergo face and neck lifts now i've done a lot of face and neck yes. lifts i train i train in america where you know it's really the kingdom of face and neck lifts but um what you can achieve now with filler and not having to undergo the downtime of surgery is is unbelievable. A lot of plastic surgeons will watch this and say, what is he talking about? He's trained for 20 years for this. But at the same time, why do something more invasive when you don't need to? If you can get a beautiful result and patients are happy, um, I, I'm all about doing the most conservative approach. So it's and a, you don't it's, necessarily have to go under the knife. You don't. Um, and patients have, uh, it's the, you know, so, so happy. And that's honestly why I'm doing so many, um, yeah. so many out there. So it's a, it's a hugely popular procedure now that I'm doing. Yeah. And can can any cream out there help with the jowls? <laughs> yeah. Look at the eye roll. No. That's <laughs> however, however, two things I wanted to add to what Dr. Ash was saying. Two things that work for me kind of with, you know, contouring my lower face, um, well, even as well as um, filler, is first of all, um, a clinic treatment called Morpheus 8. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a combination of microneedling with radio frequency. Mm -hmm. Um, despite what they tell you, it's not painless, <laughs> even with numbing That's cream. That's the treatment Judy Murray had <laughs> last oh, year. Yeah, That's and she got fantastic results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not painless. It's interesting, the um, demonstrator who did it on me actually, um, from the company, actually mentioned that she tends to find that people with darker skin tones tend to find it more um, painful. Oh. What I suspect mm -hmm. is probably, you know, again, because of our melanocytes, um, you know, they have a tendency to really absorb that energy and hence, I suspect, is the reason for the discomfort. Um, so that's something that's really worked, really helped to sort of tighten um, the skin to my lower face. So and does the, um, just to um, to elaborate on that, does the, the microneedling and the radio frequency mm. help to boost collagen levels? Then? Absolutely, yeah. So it really helps to boost collagen, which really is the scaffolding, um, you know, for your skin um, and everything within that. Um, and then, you know, if you don't want to do a clinic treatment, a great at home treatment that you can do is using microcurrent. Oh. So I use this a lot on my social media. Add me, Instagram, Dr. <laughs> Roma. Um, you know, shameless plug. Um, I absolutely love microcurrent. So um, the device that I love specifically is the New Face, N U, New oh, Face I device. Love the new face. It's so good. And I love doing that before I have an event or if I'm doing a bit of filming. It really does give that sort of instant tightening, lifting effect. Amazing. And so you know I'm coming, you know what I'm coming to you with. Can you contour <laughs> with makeup this kind of lower? Yeah. 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 And how would you do it? How yeah. would you do that? So just shade the area right. with a, a kind of bronzing or a contouring product. Contouring products are great because they're usually uh, got a bit like slightly more grey than bronzer. Bronzer could be quite red depending on the tone you've got. But yeah, any area that you shade, you'll help disguise and you'll help it kind of recede. So obviously not physically, but an optical illusion. <laughs> Wouldn't so, yeah. that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> but if you are at all concerned, and also I think as well, like we forget that our neck is shaded by our face for many people. Some people are the reverse and their neck's warmer, but for a lot of people, their neck is naturally lighter. So what can happen then is if you're under your chin and neck is brighter, it jumps forward because it's the lightest thing, which can almost highlight that area if it's an area of concern. So if you just shade it with a bit of bronzer or a contouring powder, then it it just it, it jumps out less, so it'll be less noticeable. I mean, but yeah, you can absolutely shade it just to mute slightly. Right. Um, amazing, right? We're going to go to some questions because I could honestly keep asking. I know. <laughs> asking so asking I want to learn. Learn. <laughs> Should we just stay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we just stay? <laughs> um, so let's go to the 
the studio audience. I was just about to say to you, like, I love that. I, I love that. that. <laughs> um, if there's anyone with a question, please put your hand up, and um, we've got some. We've got some questions. We've got some microphones. Testing, testing. Um, thank you all so much. Um, my question is probably more skincare based. Mm -hmm. um, so I confess I work in be the beauty world as well, but I've never actually really understood with SPF mm. what people mean when they say wear SPF every day. Are you supposed to be wearing like Amber Solaire Fact 50 or are we talking more like a foundation with SPF? What kind of thing would you mm. would you recommend to like a newcomer who's trying their best? Yeah, amazing. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, the great thing with sunscreens is that they come in and you know all sorts of different formulations, whether it be a spray, a powder, um, or kind of that traditional sunscreen. Um, again, as with all things skincare, I would really say you know go out and buy and experiment with the different textures and formulations because. I might really like a spray. Actually, I hate spray. Personally. Um, I could. I, yeah, I could. Um, but, you know, some people really love sprays. I don't. So it very much is, you know, sort of personal opinion. Um, in terms of sunscreen in foundation, please don't do that. It's a great kind of adjunct to, you know, wearing sunscreen in your skincare routine anyway but please do not depend on that a lot of people do they're like yeah my foundation has an spf of 30. i'm sure it does but the thing is you know unless you're from the brand themselves as you know an average consumer it's very difficult to determine how much sunscreen is actually within that formulation so you know to throw out a number you know it might be only 20 percent of that formulation is actually sunscreen because one thing i know for sure unless they're using maybe a chemical um sunscreen um the percentage of sunscreen is very likely to be on the lower end because if you know the the percentage of sunscreen is a lot higher that's when it starts to affect the sort of aesthetic result of of the foundation formulation yeah um so that's one thing to bear in mind mm. but also you'd need to use loads of foundation exactly. yeah, to yeah, get to so if it's exactly. a spf 30 foundation you'd need to use as much foundation as you would mm -hmm. that SPF to get the right amount of coverage mm. and you know you, we're often quite ginger aren't we with our application of foundation mm -hmm. so you wouldn't be getting the protection you expect. Um, I'm going to take a question from one of our virtual viewers um, Renee um, what happens if you have almost no brows when it comes to makeup mm -hmm. what, what would be your remedy there? Um, if you're not confident mapping out your own brows, and I'll show you how in a sec, then you can you can buy stencils. So Blink Brow Bar do a powder brow kit that has a stencil on the inside. I know Shivata do stencils. Yeah. So a physical stencil you could pop on your brow bone and kind of fill in with powder. Exactly. Um, a, a very quick whiz through how to map out your brows yourself with a pencil or a makeup brush. Um, ideally, your brow should go, the head should be kind of from the tip of your nostril straight up. That's your marker for where the head of your brow should be. Um, for the highest point, the art should be from the outer corner of your nostril through the outer side of your pupil. I don't want to get the wrong word because I know someone okay. once said the wrong word. It was hilarious. Iris, outside. <laughs> I'll share secrets, girl, when the cameras are off. Yeah. Um, when you're looking straight ahead, that should be where your art should be. And then to measure the tail, again, the corner of the nostril out to the outer corner of the eye. And that's where your tail should be. So those are roughly kind of the points to map and then kind of gently follow that. Thankfully, there are so many tutorials to watch, whether it's on Instagram or YouTube. So you can watch people really talk you in detail through it step by step. But um, if in doubt, you can always get a stencil. Amazing, great advice. Any other questions in the audience? Got one here. Hi, my name is Pippa. Um, when I started into my 40s, I had absolute blemish-free skin and now have rosacea. I'm now, I would imagine menopause, I'm 53. I need to know what products I can actually have which won't trigger a rosacea attack because I've gone through them all over the last eight, nine years. Yeah. Rosacea, I feel like, is quite a, um, it, it's it's a huge topic, isn't mm. it? Yeah, it's so huge. If you want to, um, what would you, what would you suggest yeah so the thing is with rosacea 
it's just as important to know what products to use, but also what products are not to use. So starting with the products that you should maybe avoid, um, definitely consider avoiding things that are, you know, super pumped with fragrances, um, low quality essential oils. Um, those two things can be kind of really common triggers in skincare. But then also thinking about what you're doing within your skincare routine as a whole. So um, other kind of piece of advice that I like to give out is, um, you know, avoiding piping hot water when you're cleansing your face. I don't know about you, but I love a bit of piping hot water, <laughs> but your skin probably doesn't. So just bear in mind with that. And then also considering more lifestyle things as well, because that's a really key component with regards to rosacea. So um, knowing your kind of maybe food triggers, again, spicy foods can be a real trigger. Um, alcohol can be a real trigger. I'm not saying don't drink alcohol if you do drink alcohol. But again, just maybe erring on the side of caution with that. In terms of your skincare routine, products that you should definitely gravitate towards, um, I would definitely say less is more is definitely the best approach. Um, so I love ingredients such as niacinamide, zinc, um, great anti-inflammatory um, ingredients. And then also, um, if you can get your hand on a prescription, I love prescription strength azelaic acid um, for rosacea as well. Amazing. Um, we'll make sure we include all of that in the email as well tomorrow. Um, Dr. Sony, um, could I ask you about Profilo? Mm -hmm. Is that a treat? So um, as well as anti-wrinkle injections and um, filler, there is this sort of third sec sector of, of, um, of injectables. Can yeah. you talk us through Profilo and where and how it could be used? Yeah, absolutely. So skin boosters are like have become extremely popular, I think. Profilo has picked up over the years. There's a there's a couple of other really good filler brands that also do like their equivalent of, you know, that kind of hydrating and remodeling skin injections. Essentially, it's placed just right under the surface of the skin in, in several points around the face and often the neck as well if patients want to address that area. It's got, you know, hyaluronic acid. It's got the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants that are essentially working in the layer of the skin that's under the epidermis, which is your top layer of skin. So skincare works super, super well, as we know, on the outside and then if you're if you go just under which is the dermal layers of the skin slightly deeper these injections work work really really well and profilo profilo you know there's, there's there's a lot of benefits like both short and long term of doing these treatments some some last a little bit longer like some different brands last a little bit longer depending um, but the concept of them is that you would just need maintenance pop ups every few months just to keep your skin looking glowing refreshed a bit more hydrated just look really well um, some people do it short term for like events like they're like, you know, I'm getting married in a few weeks. I want to look like my skin to look as flawless as possible. And then others want just more of a long term maintenance. So, yeah, skin boosters have, have become like extremely popular. It's something that I do on, a, on an almost daily basis. And can skin boosters um, help with crepey skin? Yeah, they can do um, depending. I mean, obviously, we're not trying to we're not creating volume here. Mm -hmm. But yes, it can help remodel some of the collagen elastin, firm up the skin slightly in certain areas as well. Um, so it can have that effect on helping um, patients with crepey or, or thinner skin as we age. Um, and especially where you're losing volume in some of those areas, it can just help give it a nice little boost. But if you need true volume, then you would need to undergo an actual filler. Right. Which is, is more for volumizing than this, this, this product would be. Okay, amazing. We have another question. Got a question over here. Got another um, skincare question. Um, are there any key differences between men's and women's skins in terms of what ingredients they should be using? Yeah, question. great question. Um, again, a very kind of controversial topic within skincare. Generally speaking, there's no kind of fundamental difference, to be honest with you. And I think the whole gendering of skincare is very much a marketing ploy, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, so, but what I have definitely noticed when it comes to kind of um, skincare products ingredients that I recommend for you know men specifically is you know it's all about formulations so where you know um, my female patients tend to prefer things like oils and and never-ending serums and this and that men just like very simple again I'm generalizing but men really like you know super simple lightweight formulations so if you want a product recommendation um, a really good um, moisturizer is from Superdrug and they have a line called B-Skin, and it's called their Moisturising Gel Cream. Really easy, doesn't flake, um, and a good amount of moisturisation as well. Um, and also just making sure that you have a great, easy cleanser. Um, a, you know, a gorgeous cleanser that I love to recommend to my male patients is um, by CeraVe. You'll probably really love their um, foaming cleanser. 
again, it's got, you know, packed with sort of ceramides, niacinamide. I'm so great for that oil control, which is often a skin concern and for men. Amazing. I'm going to um, come to you, Hannah, with a question um, about open pores or yeah. disguising the look of pores. Um, can you do that with, with makeup? Yeah, so you, you can disguise the look of pores. I don't think you can hide them completely yes. or, you know, make them shrink. So essentially, in makeup speak, you can use kind of primers that contain little spherical particles, usually of silica um, and some light reflective particles that like, actually physically fill the area and then blur the appearance of the skin so they look significantly less obvious. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, yes, you can, but it's not a long-term solution. It's a, it's a disguise, but you, you can absolutely disguise the appearance of large pores. Are there any skincare ingredients that would help mm. with, with sort of enlarged pores? Yeah, absolutely. Even I'm just going to quickly touch upon the makeup side because, and please tell me um, what you think about this from an expert point of view. Um, again, I have, you know, oily skin, so pores is very much a concern for me. And so because of that, I often find I'm a little bit scared to use highlighter on yeah. those sort of areas, i.e. like, you know, obviously my cheek area because I find it just accentuates it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I wanted to add from a from makeup point of view. In terms of skincare, again, guys, you cannot open and close your pores. It's a myth. <laughs> they are not doors. <laughs> you know, they're not doors. But as Hannah, you know, touched upon, you can minimise the appearance of them. Um, just like injectables, to a degree, skincare is one big illusion. I always say that, you know, if the overall health of your skin looks great, nine times out of ten, no one's going to notice you have massive pores like no one's gonna notice because what they're gonna focus on at first is that oh my god her skin's glowing mm -hmm. and then maybe if they're nitpicky and they're super close to you they might kind of see the pores um but in terms of products um retinols again i keep my gun on about them but specifically i have found that prescription strength retinols so specifically um tretinoin has been really useful for me in terms of minimizing the appearance um and then also um bhas so specifically salicylic acid is a great one too Amazing. Okay. Uh, I've probably got time for a couple of more questions. I'm going to be really naughty and run over slightly. Um, <laughs> shall we? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, what's the, because we get inundated with so much information about makeup, skincare, injectables. What's the biggest myth that you'd maybe like to debunk? What's the biggest waste of money? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh well, where do we go there? <laughs> That's a hard one. Mm. I feel like I've really got to think about that. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. There's got to be something. Yeah. <laughs> let's come back to that one at the end. Let's take yeah. another Ooh. question and let's mull that over. Yeah. That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm not sure if I misheard. Is there a difference between retinol, retinoids and retinol? Yes. Yeah, so two different products. Okay, I wasn't sure that I missed that one. Yeah, so great question. So I know I have used them interchangeably, so that might be a little bit confusing. Sorry, guys. Um, but essentially, um, retinoids is kind of the family of vitamin A derivatives. Um, within that kind of retinoid family, you have things like retinol palmitate, retinol, tretinoin. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I've kind of used them interchangeably. Okay, I think I saw a few couple more hands up. Um, I guess this is a bit of a makeup question, but whatever I try to do, I can't prevent um, under eye and eyelid creasing. Um, so any product recommendations or techniques to try and prevent that would be great. Yeah, sure. So um, it, with your eyelid, is that when you're wearing your makeup? Yeah. Do you put your eye cream on your eyelid in the morning? So I, I probably, I probably wouldn't put eye cream on your eyelid <laughs> in the morning. I I, I, like you can like, absolutely do it all around the orbital bone in the evening, but maybe skip the eyelid in the morning because that could be causing your eyeshadow to crease. If it's just normal because you've got oily eyelids, then something like it's an old classic, but it really works. The Urban Decay Primer Potion is a brilliant um, base for your eyeshadow to stick to when it comes to your under eye um 
different concealers really settle differently. So the higher coverage and the drier finish, the more likely they're going to like crease or look dry. So actually, it's, it might sound counterintuitive, but the slightly more hydrating kind of tacky ones um, are slightly more flattering. They don't settle quite so much. Honestly, I can't stress enough the pressing technique will help eliminate that because as you press you're kind of working the makeup into the skin and then lifting off the excess with the pad of your finger as you do it if you have found that throughout the day it has creased a little your finger to the rescue a quick <laughs> pad and you'll tap it out and um, if you set your under eye concealer with powder be wary that baking or that it's a massive trend at the moment it's super deeper unflattering if you've got fine skin around the eye so just don't do that um but if you do want to set a concealer in place with powder to ensure it lasts the day just be really mindful that you don't have any creases in your concealer when you come to set it because you'll just lock in a crease which is really maddening so just always make sure like in terms of setting concealer i'll always do the a concealer immediately after foundation but i won't set it until i finish absolutely everything else so kind of give it time to settle then do kind of a final final crease out and then a tiny touch of powder okay i'm gonna i'm we're, we're, let's do one more question to skincare and makeup um when i was a teenager i had severe acne so i'm kind of like left with I don't want to say potholes, but it's almost like untextured skin. What is there a kind of like a magic potion to kind of smooth the appearance of skin texture that's kind of got acne scarring? And then on, from a makeup point of view, how would you go about covering covering acne scarring or kind of really raised blemishes? Yeah, so from a skincare point of view, again, two key actives, um, retinoids and also um, acids. Um, so specifically things like um, azelaic acid. Um, and then definitely look into clinic treatments as well. Um, I don't know if you want to chime in here, mm -hmm. um, but definitely microneedling is going to be your best friend. Um, I've had amazing results with patients on that. Um, if you want to bump it up to a whole other level, you could do that Morpheus 8 treatment that I was talking about where it combines microneedling with radio frequency. Um, but either way, you do need sort of a couple of different approaches um, to improve the texture. It still may not be 100% perfect, but by all means, um, as long as you're patient, you can get an improvement of, you know, even up to 70%, if not more. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of makeup? Yeah, so I know, you know, again, the kind of... I know some people swear by the um, slightly more like pore blurring primers in terms if it's a real, you know, if it's a deep scar. So whether it's something like Trini's Miracle Blur as something to not completely disguise their appearance, but maybe take the edge off. Um, is it texture you're more concerned about or is there discoloration from the scarring? Um, no, it's more texture. Yeah. Um, so that's something you can do. Again, we were talking about this earlier. Um, if you highlight the area, then you could highlight the areas of texture. So maybe um, the areas that you're concerned about are areas to consider keeping a bit more matte so you're not bouncing the light around the contours. Amazing. And I think we will leave it there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight at the Soho Hotel. And um, I hope you've learned um, some new tips and tricks and techniques. I know I certainly have. Thank you so much to our amazing panel. Thank you. Um, I feel like we could have gone on for quite a long time. <laughs> there are so many questions. There are, you know, lots of questions coming in from people at home as well. Um, so I think we should definitely do this again. Um, and so thanks again so much for coming along and good night. Thank you. Thank you.